Back in 2019, my business partner and I were at the lowest point in our careers. We'd gone all in on a huge opportunity, which seemed like the deal of a lifetime, but ended up losing us one million pounds. Now, at the time, I was probably the most stressed I've ever been, but in hindsight, this mistake has taught me more about property investing than all of the wins put together and led us to much bigger and better deals over time. So today, I'm gonna to share this story with you so you can learn my lessons and avoid my mistakes without losing all that money. But in order to do that, I need to take you back to the start. So 12 years ago, my business partner, Rob, set up his own investment company. He'd been working in the property industry for years. So he used his relationships with developers to source property in bulk at a discount and sold it on to property investors who were cash rich, but time poor and didn't want to go out hunting for deals on their own. In the early days, Rob was sitting in his spare bedroom, calling anyone he could think of, scrambling around to try to find clients. But over time, boosted by the success of the show we started co-presenting, The Property Podcast, the business grew and grew until it had a new challenge. It had plenty of clients lined up, but not enough property to sell to them. By this time, I'd come into the business as a co-owner, but neither of us could crack the core problem. There just wasn't enough quality stock being built in the right locations, and especially not enough where the developers were willing to give us the discount our clients expected. So what do you do in a situation like this? Well, if you have a grandiose sense of self-importance, you look for inspiration to the likes of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. Amazon was growing so quickly and had so many visitors from across the world it needed huge data centers full of web servers to keep the site up. And it was so business critical, they decided to build their own, which eventually became a multi-billion dollar business in its own right. Tesla needed the ability to manufacture batteries in enough volume to keep up with orders was absolutely critical. So they built their own giant factories to avoid relying on external suppliers. So there was our solution. If the stock wasn't there, we would just have to build it ourselves. And the theory was fantastic. It would give us complete control over our pipeline of stock. And because developers normally make a margin for themselves, we would be able to make a profit on the build and still offer the properties at a discount to our clients. The venture would involve risking all the cash that we'd saved up in the business and taking out an expensive development loan. But it would be worth it. So to get the venture started, we found some land that already had planning permission for 14 houses. The site was in Crewe, close to the train station, which was perfect. The Northwest was our favorite investment location, and we always look for fundamentals like transport lengths that will enable an area to grow. And we got off to a great start by pre-selling all 14 houses to our clients before construction started, removing a huge element of risk. We found an experienced advisor, and with their help, we employed someone to lead the construction project on site. And then we sat back to excitedly imagine the day when they would all be finished, leaving us with not just a great product for our investors, but a profit of what should have been between 400,000 and 500,000 pounds as well. But that moment of excitedly anticipating the future and thinking about all the profit we were going to make was the last happy day for quite a while. First came the delays and delays in construction projects are normal, but there comes a point when they're not normal anymore. And through our lack of experience, we were probably too slow to notice this. Delays aren't just annoying, but they're also extremely expensive because you're paying monthly for a development loan. So every month that a project runs over means thousands and thousands of pounds in extra interest costs. Then things got even worse. A major contractor who was working on an absolutely critical element of the construction vanished into thin air. They just didn't turn up on site one day and we never heard from them again. Not only that, but when we found a new contractor to replace them, it turned out that the work that had been done was completely substandard and had to be redone at a cost that wiped out at a stroke more than a quarter of the profit we were supposed to make. But that was still just the beginning. Because the original contractor had made such a mess of the project, we decided it was time to take legal action. So we started searching for the agreement, but it turned out that the person we'd employed to lead the project had not put any legal agreements in place and everything was done on a handshake. Again, something perhaps we should have noticed. Something else that we should have noticed, although people were trying very hard to make sure we didn't, was that costs were being hidden. To make it seem like the project was on budget, costs were being pushed out into the future and invoices were being sat on. And to make it look like the build was more on schedule than it really was, work was being done completely out of sequence, such as putting flooring down in the houses way before it was time to do so, meaning that it got ruined later in construction and needed to be laid all over again. At this point, we were holding meetings about financing the site monthly. And at one meeting, where we dug into everything, got hold of all the evidence and added everything up, it turned out that not just some of the profit had gone, but all of it. 
and we were now looking at suffering a loss. And from there, as time went by, the loss just grew and grew as finance costs ramped up and more shoddy work came to light and needed to be redone. And the longer the project was delayed, the more tricky things got. Even though we'd already sold all the houses, we started losing sales as buyers' mortgage offers ran out and they understandably lost faith in the whole project. And finding new buyers took time, which of course was more money. By the time the project was finally wrapped up, what should have taken one year ended up taking four. And what should have been a half million pound profit turned into a one million pound loss. And during this time, the stable, highly profitable business that this was supposed to benefit was starved of cash and was pushed close to the edge, as were we. The only winners were the buyers, who ended up with houses that were in a great location and in the end were of great quality because they were pretty much built twice. And because they'd waited so long and locked in their price at the start, they'd made a significant capital gain before they'd even completed. So. What lessons can we learn from this whole sorry affair? Well, the first is to start small. We are far from the first people in property to bite off more than they can chew. And 14 houses isn't the biggest project in the world. But if we'd started with just a small block of flats, we would have been able to learn all the same lessons at a far smaller scale and possibly could have avoided using finance, which would have saved us a load of cost as well. Realistically, you'll never know less than you do before your first project and you will make mistakes that you'd never have anticipated. So it's far better to make those mistakes and learn those first lessons on a small project when the stakes are lower. It's not the time to be going all in, risking all your cash and putting yourself in a position where you need to have a win. The next lesson is to get your costings right at the start because as it turns out, the half million pound profit we thought we were going to make was a fantasy from the start. Because the project had been costed up wrongly, we ended up paying too much for the land and as soon as we'd done that, making anything other than a small profit was impossible. This is a mistake you can easily make when flipping properties as well. The price you'll be able to achieve at the end, you can't affect at all. And the cost of refurbishment is hard to influence. The biggest thing you have control over is the purchase price. Get that wrong and you've set yourself up for months or years of work with nothing to show at the end of it. And if you need a way to efficiently cost up all your projects accurately, you can click on the link in the description to download our free deal calculator. Next, don't be too quick to trust. The hiring process we went through was a robust one and we did have an advisor on our side, but that doesn't guarantee a good outcome. And we were so far from our area of knowledge that we had no alternative but to have blind faith in the advisor and those hires because we didn't have the ability to verify. In property, you can't possibly know everything yourself. You have to put faith in solicitors, mortgage brokers and builders, and it is gonna irritate them if you question and second guess everything that they do. But we were too hands off and too distant from the project for too long. We should have defaulted to a position of more skepticism and then started giving more trust and freedom as things were proven to have been on track. But then the final lesson from how we eventually got out of it, and that is what you give your attention to gets sorted. Once the full extent of the disaster came to light, we started having daily meetings with the team that we brought in to finish the job. And the sense of urgency that came from talking about it daily and expecting people to come with answers and actions for the next day meant that we got to the end much faster than we otherwise would have done, possibly saving another six-figure sum. In property in particular, time is money. Things need to happen quickly. And if something's not going well, it's not going to magically sort itself out. You will need to act at some point. So the quicker you do that and the more focus you give it, the better the end result will be. The point of sharing this story isn't because I enjoy looking like an idiot in public, but because it's important to learn from other people's mistakes and maybe you can avoid living your own painful story as a result of hearing ours. But it's not just people's failures that you can learn from. The best investors I know also model successes of others, giving themselves a blueprint to follow rather than having to slowly and painfully figure everything out for themselves. And after watching countless people become property millionaires over the 12 plus years that we've been in the business, we realized that there were some unspoken rules that they were using to build their wealth. So check out this video next, where I explain how you can, instead of losing a million, make it instead and become a property millionaire.